I am Dr. Rick Kirshner. I am an Oregon licensed naturopathic physician and a senior vitalist with the Naturopathic Medicine Institute. I'm a best-selling author on conflict resolution and a filmmaker on medical history. And I'll be your host for what I'm certain will be an extraordinary evening with some fascinating speakers, followed by questions and a discussion. I can tell you right at the top of our evening that nobody on our panel is anti-vaccine. We're not here to tell you what to think or what to do. We're basing these vaccine education seminars on something Robert F. Kennedy Jr. said, and we believe is true. He said, Americans can handle an open discussion about vaccines. And our business this evening is pressing. Once upon a time, most parents obediently brought their children to the doctor when shots were due. The compliance rate was very high. Parents who objected for one reason or another just got an exemption from school attendance mandates and they kept quiet about it. Every state had a medical exemption, most had a religious exemption, and many had easily obtained philosophical or personal belief exemptions. Kids sat side by side in schools with no concern about each other's vaccination status. And it was common knowledge among parents about how to deal with normal childhood infections and fevers. Vaccines are a marketing dream come true for the drug industry. Fear drives demand and they practically sell themselves. But as the number of scheduled vaccines has grown from three in my childhood to seven in the 1980s, and now 16 vaccines requiring at least 70 doses, the number of chronically ill kids has reached epidemic proportions, and more parents have naturally become interested in understanding the risks versus the benefits of these medical products. But as more parents began questioning the schedule or specific vaccines, the states started repealing exemptions and trying to throw healthy kids out of school if their parents didn't submit. The problem with coercion is that it undermines trust. The result is that in state after state, parents whose concerns were ignored started organizing to defend themselves from the coercion descending on state capitals in ever great num greater numbers to voice their concerns and objections, and many of them had severely injured children in tow. For example, in New York this summer, thousands of angry parents rallied outside the Albany State House in opposition to a hastily passed law that ended religious exemptions. In Oregon, House Bill 3063 generated huge crowds of parents rallying against an attempt to throw 36,000 kids out of school for the crime of missing even a single dose of 11 scheduled vaccines. In California, despite the fact that an unprecedented number of outraged parents surrounded the Capitol to make their objections known, the California legislature ridiculed and then ignored them and passed new laws further limiting medical exemptions. And that's the only kind of exemptions available in California because California removed conscience exemptions with previous bills. California's bills signed by their governor have successfully and completely undermined the ability and willingness of medical doctors in California to write vaccine exemptions based on actual medical history of their young patients. 882 out of 882 California pediatric practices were contacted and they said that they would not write any medical exemptions even for a child who had gone into anaphylactic shock following a previous vaccination. Anaphylaxis is a life-threatening allergic reaction that kills rapidly by shutting off the airway. It's one of the few allowable indications for a medical exemption in California now and not a single pediatric practice will write such an exemption. Promises made on previous bills were broken, and it's now all or none in California, and if you don't cooperate, your child is excluded from a public education, and if you're poor, you lose benefits provided by the state. The incremental approach to tightening vaccine laws in California has shown us the real agenda of lawmakers in multiple states who are introducing bills to deny the right to make informed choices about risky, liability-free medical products 
based on conscience or medical history. Many Oregon families are rightly concerned that what happened in California will embolden the same forces in Oregon. We've been told that medical industry insiders elected to our legislature are planning to bring another mandate bill in the coming short session aimed squarely at infringing the right of families to make medical decisions for their kids. We've been told that they need some kind of win to save face after their failure to pass it the last time. And if our governor, Kate Brown, has her way, she'll change the rules in the legislature so instead of them needing two-thirds of the members to form a quorum, only half will need to be present, effectively allowing the Democrat supermajority to do anything they please. The industry-chosen and government-sponsored official narrative that vaccines are perfectly safe and effective for all is getting harder to question in public. Censorship is growing across American society regarding the science that conflicts with that narrative. Amazon has removed books and movies that dare to question the narrative. Facebook, Pinterest, and Instagram have throttled the conversation, and people searching for information on vaccine safety and risk profiles are now likely to be redirected to a government website promoting this safe and effective narrative. And I want to make this obvious to you. There is only one industry in America that has had liability waived on its products that carry known risks that has gotten censorship put in place to restrict criticism of its liability-free products, that has gotten laws passed to coerce families to submit to vaccination and to accept all the liability if something goes wrong, and that has purchased the press to daily encourage hostility and fear to be directed against those crazy anti-vaxxers, the pejorative term used by the industry to mislabel and marginalize informed parents trying to protect their children. You know, if I'm against neurotoxins in my food, does that mean I'm anti-food? And all of this for what most people will acknowledge as the most corrupt industry on the planet. They're the number one lobbyist in the halls of power, the number one advertiser in our media. They're a top donor to political campaigns at the state, national, and party level. And notably, the four companies that make vaccines mandated for our children are all convicted felons, and they've all paid billions and billions of dollars in penalties, fines, and damages for their criminal behavior on their other products. Now the big tech companies are making deals, like Google with a $668 million partnership with GlaxoSmithKline, and which is now hiding, blocking, and delisting sites with vaccine risk information. How people can believe these corrupt companies have found God on vaccines is proof of the power of censorship combined with relentless pro-pharma propaganda. Vaccines have become a heated topic in our schools, our workplaces, neighborhoods, social groups, and religious centers. And the media establishment refuses to investigate and instead relentlessly promotes the benefits of vaccines while ignoring questions of safety and actively suppressing scientifically valid criticism. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to talk about this. And we're going to. We've got a great lineup of speakers, including Oregon State Senator Dennis Linthicum, Dr. Brian Hooker, and Dr. Jennifer Margulis. And we have Tiffany Trahan to thank for the opportunity. Tiffany is the founder of the Oregon Vaccine Education Seminar. She's a Jill of all trades and master of none, as she puts it. Being a parent with concerns about mandated vaccine products was all the inspiration she needed to organize these events throughout the state of Oregon, because one person can make a difference. She's an award-winning journalist, an author. She's nationally recognized as a writer who's not afraid to stick her neck out. She's worked on child survival campaign in West Africa, spoke out against child slavery on primetime TV in France. She taught post-colonial literature to non-traditional students in inner city Atlanta. Dr. Margulis has been researching, writing, and speaking about issues related to vaccine safety and safe vaccination for over 15 years. 
She earned her BA from Cornell University, her MA from the University of California at Berkeley, and her PhD from Emory. She's the author of Your Baby, Your Way, and the co-author with Dr. Paul Thomas, MD, of The Addiction Spectrum and the number one Amazon bestseller, The Vaccine-Friendly Plan. She is currently working on her ninth book, and she's my dear friend, and if you live in Ashland, you may recognize her. Jennifer rides her bike and walks all over town. She's going to address the question, why are 54% of today's children, the most heavily vaccinated children in the world and in human history, so chronically ill? Please put your hands together for my friend and neighbor, Dr. Jennifer Margaret. So um, I'm going to confess that when Vaxxed, the movie, how many people have seen Vaxxed? Wow, this is an amazing thing, <laughs> amazing crowd. Um, when Vaxxed came out, I saw it in the theaters three times. And I, the first time I went just to watch it and try to absorb it, and the second time I went so that I could really understand it, and the third time I went because I felt like I had missed a lot of the information, and a lot of what Dr. Hooker was saying in that presentation was presented in Vax. But there was something about listening to Dr. Hooker explain it from his point of view today that it took my breath away. And I don't know about all of you, but I, it, that was hard. That was hard to hear what's going on. I am an eternally optimistic person. I always want to believe that the government has our best interests in mind. I, I do still believe, and, and we have such an incredible government representative here, and we know that he cares about every single person in this room and every baby on the planet. And, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, and, and I do believe for the doctors, I don't know if we have any medical doctors in the room uh, beside, uh, other than um, naturopathic and alternative practitioners, but, I, but oh, actually I know we do. We have one amazing one right here in the front, Dr. Diane Powell. Um, but, if, but I want to believe that doctors are really healers and that that's what they're trying to do is heal people and help them. So I'm going to try to hold on to that, even though Brian just shattered my world. <laughs> and like I said, it's not like I haven't thought about or you know, considered these issues before, but um, it, it's just, it's hard. I think these are hard topics to talk about. And I think most of the people in this room are not new to this issue, but I'm set to speaking to the people who are. There's a lot of information to synthesize and to think about and to consider, and if you're feeling overwhelmed right now, you're not alone. Um, so I'll start there. So I'd like to ask people to stand up. If you knew someone who had a chronic illness or had autism when you were a child, please stand up. Okay, so one person, one, two people, three people. Three people, four people. When you were a child, if you knew somebody with a chronic illness or autism, is that, is there anybody else? Four people stood up. Would you four people stand back up again? Now I'd like to ask you right now today to please stand up if you have a child with a chronic illness or you know a child today who has a chronic illness. Stand up. So there are only about five, six, seven people sitting down, so you can all sit down. So when people say it's just better diagnosis or we're just more aware of what's going on, you just saw in this room that maybe four people when they were growing up, and I don't know, the youngest person who stood up was probably born in 1970-ish, no, something like that, um, maybe slightly later knew somebody who was affected by chronic disease, and then every single person in this room, except for maybe five people, knows somebody or is the, the parent of someone who's been affected by chronic disease. When my daughter was in fourth grade, four people in her public school class had autism spectrum disorders. Um, I have a friend right now who has a child who is so severely allergic um, that she, he's he, they carry an EpiPen everywhere, and they've watched their child flatline, and he almost died 
from the tiniest exposure to tree nuts. Um, and I, you know, my, my son who just started high school was playing basketball with a middle schooler who was then diagnosed with type 1 juvenile diabetes. So the chronic diseases that we're talking about, you tell me what they are. What is it that you know that the people that you know are suffering from? Which chronic diseases are children getting today? Yes? Rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, rheumatoid arthritis in very young children. What else? Asthma, what did you say? IBS and Crohn's. IBS, that's irritable bowel syndrome and Crohn's disease, which were re really unheard of, I think, 30 years ago. Yes. COPD. What is that? COPD. COPD. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Jesus Christ. Okay, so chronic <laughs> obstructive pulmonary disease. In a child? In a, in a child. Uh, my half brother has it. Okay, and was diagnosed as a child? Or? I don't know. Oh, okay. Okay, is that, well, that's a new one for me. Mary. FSGS, the part of kidney syndrome. Okay, and that's, uh, you have a, a, a personal... It was presenting in, in toddlers. Okay. Um, yeah, the blogger over there. I remember that you're blogging and you've got two vaccine injured kids. Yeah. Um, eczema. Extremely common. Okay, she took mine and I didn't stand up because we know what that, but would you call Absolutely. Well, so oh, that's an excellent question, right? Because you're going to see a lot of different statistics, right? But so what is a chronic illness? And, you know, different ways, you're going to see it defined differently. But chronic childhood illness is, there, there's many different definitions. One of the working definitions is something that lasts beyond a year after diagnosis and that interferes in some way with your daily life. And so we have a young woman in our lives who has such um, chronic and severe eczema, it's literally all over her body, all over her face, all over her arms, and it's absolutely painful, and it's always getting infected, and she's trying drug after drug after drug. So yes, you could have stood up in the second round. Lynn. I just wanted to say, um, nobody's mentioned seizures, and they're so common now. Yep. And I work as a substitute in the schools, and every classroom has a box of tissue. And those kids are so sick. All they do is blow their nose all day long. And they have allergies. They're, they're just, they're, it's incredible. We never had that when I was growing. Did you say two different things? You said nobody's said mentioned seizures. seizures. Okay. But I hear people talking, I hear the teachers talking about their kids that have seizures. Like a lot of times I'm studying because a teacher has to take their kid to the doctor. Because a child is having a seizure. Because a child is, is ill. So this is a, a person who's substitute teaching in the public schools in this local area. We're in Southern Oregon, for those of us who are watching online. And by the way, we are taping this live, um, if you didn't know that. <laughs> We're telling you now. Um, but, and, then, and then kids who are just chronically sick with, what is it called? The, the fancy word is rhinitis, um, yeah. what, uh, right? Sinus problems, okay. Can we count cancer in children? I mean, I'm in my 60s, and when I was a kid, nobody had cancer. Now babies are being born with cancer. Yeah. I mean, is cancer an epidemic? Can we call it that? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the fo Focus for Health, where Dr. Hooker is the science advisor, when you look at their statistics, they say the number one danger and killer of children is cancer. So it actually, or the number one diagnosis, I should say, because actually we have better rates of survival. That is one sort of small silver lining. But we also know that cancer, childhood cancer is very associated with adult problems, health problems in adults. So we, we have more cancer than ever before. We do have higher survival rates, but we also have this correlation between childhood cancer and adult health. A couple more. Um, Food allergies. Okay, it's thank you for mentioning that. It's impossible to cook for kids nowadays. Yeah, so food allergies are so bad that you may not, I mean, they're, they're, they're locking down the public schools. You may not bring in food anywhere that's not in a commercial kitchen because they're afraid that it might be cross-contaminated. On the bench at my daughter's school, it says, you know, this is a nut-free zone. And so we're not talking about food intolerances. We're talking about nut-free, meaning you cannot have peanuts or almonds or walnuts because people are getting, and this is not a joke, they're going into anaphylactic shock. People are dying. We had a 15-year-old girl who didn't read the cookies right on the box, and she she grabbed a cookie that had nuts in it from Nabisco, and they could not get an EpiPen into her fast enough, and she died. And if you Google that, if you Google, you know, just girl death, 
nut allergies. You're going to start seeing all sorts of stories from every state. It's really devastating. One more, yeah. Also, violence, uh, behavioral issues, even mm -hmm. when they're not in the full autism spectrum. We have the articles being covered about the violence in the schools now. Okay, so I'm really glad that you mentioned that. That's really important, and I would put that under mental disorders, which we're seeing on the rise. We're seeing depression on the rise. We're seeing ADHD on the rise. We're seeing all sorts of autism spectrum disorder problems. So those could all be classified as neurological problems, right? And you probably know this, but we have, right now, we're actually starting to medicate children for these issues, and even infants, like nine-month-old infants, are starting to be medicated for ADHD and for depression, and so we're seeing infants on psychotropic drugs, which I find incredibly disturbing and, you know, problematic. So, the, so one study, and we were using that as the headline, it was interesting because I was going back and reading it, was saying that 54% of U.S. children have at least one of 20 chronic health conditions in, in that study. Other numbers that you'll see will say something like 15 to 18% of American children are suffering from a chronic disease. And the point is that the increases are enormous. So chronic illness in this country has increased over 400%. So any rubric that you're deciding to look at, each study is going to have different statistics, each chronic disease is going to have a different, a different path, but if you did the graphing like our friend Dr. Hooker likes to do, what you're going to see is you're going to be seeing these rises. And so this, the point here is that our children are not doing well. Our children are sick. Our children are not surviving and thriving, which is what every parent wants. So why are we here today? Why are we having this conversation? If our children were thriving, if our children were healthy, if our children did not have neurological damage and horrible seizure disorders, and we, we didn't mention cyclical fever disorder, which is a new one that the naturopathic doctors are seeing, cyclical fever disorders, where I was in the office with somebody who was lobbying at the Capitol, and she said that her daughter's fever would go up to 106 and it would happen in a cyclical way. And then I talked to a naturopathic doctor in, in Ashland. This, was a, this is somebody who moved from California who was in her representative's office begging him. He's one of the only Republicans who's been behind forcing mandates and saying to him, I'm a refugee from California. I moved here because we're a free state and I want you to keep it this way. My daughter would not qualify for a medical exemption for vaccines, but my doctor told me that if she were vaccinated again, she would die. I, that it's absolutely not safe. And so that's the kind of situation we're in. So, you know, the California legislators and the, and the powers that be in the CDC, everybody's so perplexed. Where are these crazy people coming from? You know, why are these parents coming out? Why are they, if you saw anything or if you went down to Sacramento, you'll see that the people who are holding vigil in California are getting arrested. They've been arresting some breastfeeding moms because they care so much about this, they've been sort of doing civil disobedience and rattling the walls, right? Why are people doing that? Well, because we should be protecting our children. What a mother wants to do more than anything in the world is keep her child safe and healthy. And if our children in America were safe and healthy, you wouldn't have to be here today having these uncomfortable feelings and learning about government corruption that, you know, makes me want to scream. Right? So that's the point. Our children aren't doing well, and then the question is why? Well, I guess if we look at these um, graphs, and if you all have very scientific minds, we're going to say that one of the main reasons, it, the answer has been known, uh, Brian said, since 2001, right? Um, but what, the, what is the mainstream sort of status quo science, to scientists and doctors saying? One of the things they're saying is, we don't know. They're saying, we have no idea. We don't know. We have some ideas that it might be genetic. So the reason why we're having these rise in all these problems is because you have bad genes. Another thing we like to blame it on is because women are older when they have babies, and men are too. So another problem that is very nice to blame is that it's the people themselves because you waited too long to have a kid. You were 35, God forbid. <laughs> And another reason is that we're too fat. So obesity is another reason that we're, poor, that we're blaming a lot of these things, that the moms are too fat. So look at what that explanation says. It says basically anything that's going wrong in human health is the, is the fault of the human. It's not the fault of the environment. 
But we do have doctors everywhere, everywhere, and they are starting to come out of the woodwork, and we will talk about Mary's question about how do we get more people to speak up. We do have doctors making nods, and you have to learn to read between the lines. So James Perrin is an MD from Harvard University. He's one of the four most scholars and nationally known experts on um, chronic disease and rising chronic disease among children, and what does he say? He says, Genetic susceptibility typically interacts with environmental triggers or exposures to cause these conditions and a number of in utero and postnatal exposures, right? But then he goes on to say, but it hasn't really been studied. So every single doctor that you look at is going to say, yes, something is going on in the environment. We're not exactly sure what it is. So here's the thing. I obviously... You know, it's not that vaccines are causing all of these problems and that if we sort of stop vaccinating, our problems among our children would magically go away. I don't think that scientifically that's a tenable argument. I do think that if we made judicious and evidence-based changes to the vaccine program as it stands today, that we could solve some of the health problems, human health problems overnight. But there are, there are many environmental issues that are contributing to our compromised immune system and I'm not going to take much time because I really want to have, I have so many questions to ask our panelists that I don't want to, I don't want to overload you with information, but what our children are exposed, what our children are exposed to is very important. What our children are eating is very important. What, how their, our children are spending their time also really matters how much exercise they're getting, whether or not they're being breastfed, so that goes into what they're eating, and what kind of media exposure they're getting. So all of these things are playing a huge role in the health of our children. And one of them, the first one I said, is what they're being exposed to. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about vaccines for a minute. We're giving vaccines to pregnant women in utero, as many as three. If you have the unfortunate um, timing that your pregnancy spans two flu seasons, you will be given a flu vaccine in your first trimester and then you will be given another flu vaccine in your third trimester. You'll also be told that you have to have a pertussis vaccine. I see people in the audience shaking their heads and looking at each other and saying, I had no idea. Because when I was pregnant, which was in my, the, my, my first pregnancy in 1999, we were told to stay as far away from anything that could possibly cause harm to the fetus, including vaccines. That was a big no-no in 1990, as recently as 1999, so that was just 20 years ago, right? And, and before that, it was even actively discouraged, you know, so you're not supposed to eat raw cheese and you're try, you want to stay away from mercury-containing fish. But all of a sudden now in America, we, we're still telling women, don't change the litter box of your cat, don't eat the raw cheese, stay away from mercury and fish, but it's okay to inject you twice, not once, but twice, with a mercury-containing vaccine. And you know that mercury is heavy. Dr. Hooker could talk to this much more than I can. He's a biochemist. My PhD is not in science, right? But if you, if you're, if you are using a multi-dose flu shot, is the one that contains thimerosal, if you get your flu shot from the bottom of the barrel and it's never been shaken up, you might be injecting a, a totally toxic amount of aluminum into, I'm mean, sorry, of mercury into a child. So this is before the child is even born. And then right at birth, we're giving another vaccine. This is another thing that's changed. Right at birth, we're giving another vaccine for hepatitis B, which I think almost everyone in this room already knows is a sexually transmitted disease. This is another sort of new vaccine that we've just, that we've started giving in the last, um, well, it's complicated, but in the last 25 years, basically, and for a sexually transmitted disease within hours of birth. Well, if you talk to an immunologist, I don't know if any of you have, have ever uh, interviewed an immunologist who works on animals. It's a very interesting conversation, and you talk to them about giving an animal um, a vaccine at birth, right at birth, and they say, oh yeah, we do that. We do that when we want to disrupt the immune system. When you want to cause an immune disruption in an animal, and humans, we are also probably, right, animals, you give them an injection. So we're doing something that everyone in immunology knows is disruptive to the immune system. So I interviewed an immunologist who was Yale educated and had been doing research, a vaccine researcher, and you know, who was 
very outspoken why we should not be doing the hepatitis B vaccine. And I said, wait a second, what are you telling me? Is this really true? If I ask another immunologist, will they say that this is the case? And she said, of course, everyone in my field knows this. This is how you disrupt the immune system. And I said, well, then why are we disrupting the immune system of human babies right at birth? Is that scientifically evidence-based practice? You all can tell me the answer to that. Well, it's a lot of money for the drug companies and there's something very interesting that goes on because if you create chronic illnesses in children, you create a huge financial gain for big business. And, you know, I'm not saying that to be, you know, a conspiracy theorist or to be negative. I told you I'm an eternal optimist, right? But the truth is, is, is that if your child has type 1 juvenile diabetes, your child is in the system of big pharma for the rest of his or her life. And I should say his life, because actually it turns out that boys are being so disproportionately affected by these chronic illnesses, especially by neurological damage and brain damage. That's very interesting to me. I don't know why we don't have more men speaking up about this, because you know the majority of the people in this room are women, and the majority of the people who have been fighting this are women. And unfortunately, one of the ways that the powers that be dismiss people who are talking about this is they say there are those hysterical women. But the truth is, is that we are creating a generation of, of boys that are so brain damaged and have so many problems that they're not actually going to be able to reproduce. You, if you were here last time, you know that the average life expectancy, when you look at when people die, the average life expectancy of a child with autism is 36 years old. You know, that's devastating. That's devastating to the people in this room who have children with autism. In any case, if you want to protect a child's brain at birth, the last thing you want to do is inject them <coughs> with vaccines. The vaccines do not contain thimerosal anymore except for the multi-dose flu shot and a couple of others. Like if you be careful because if you decide you want to do a tetanus only shot, the ones that are available actually do contain thimerosal. Anyone can look up what's, can, what's inside a vaccine by googling vaccine excipient list and you will get a PDF that is constantly being updated of all of the ingredients in every single vaccine. But unfortunately, what we're doing now is we're injecting children with aluminum. And as you know, if you've been following this debate, that aluminum is neurotoxic, highly neurotoxic, and the cumulative totals of aluminum that we're exposing children to in the first year of life far, far exceed federal safety standards, published safety standards. And the amount of time, there's actually new research that's about to come out, the amount of time that a child is spending with elevated exposures to aluminum is very, very high. We have aluminum in the vaccines because that's how we get non-live vaccines to work. So if you have a live viral vaccine, you, ha you usually have better efficacy rates because the body recognizes the, the vaccine as something foreign and the body works to get rid of it. If you do non-live vaccines, so much so, let me just say this, this is very interesting. Oh God, I said I was gonna be brief. Okay, I really, I'm not gonna geek out too much, but this is so interesting. There's some research that's been going on right now to, about the benefits, this will be hard for you to hear, but it's still really important, about the benefits of live viral vaccines for the overall health of children. So some researchers, I think they're from Denmark, Christina Benn, B-E-N-N, -N, has been conducting this research that shows that if you give an oral polio virus vaccine to a newborn in Guinea-Bissau, which is where she's been doing her research, that that ch female children have, are much more likely to survive. They're much less likely to die. It's like four full times more likely to survive infancy than if you don't do a live polio virus. And she's not saying you should get a polio virus vaccine because of polio, but she's saying that vaccines have these non-specific effects. This is right now cutting edge research that's coming out. Well, what's interesting is that that's about live viral vaccines. When you look at what happens when you give these non live vaccines, the problem, and you all know this, with the viral vaccines is that they provoke an immune response and sometimes they give you the disease you're trying to be protected against and sometimes they cause the same kind of brain damage that you might get 
if you got that vaccine. So we don't give the pertussis vaccine in the live form anymore. We give attenuated, that's why there's a little A, attenuated, which means we have to make the body respond to it and you do that by adding in aluminum. And the problem with that is when you have the body respond to the aluminum, the body's also gonna respond to other things. The body has to find out what it's responding to and one of the theories is that it's going to start attacking itself. So there seems to be a very direct relationship with exposure to aluminum and these autoimmune conditions. Autoimmune disorders are when the body starts to attack itself. If the body has been given, it's a non-specific effect. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get the body to recognize if it comes in contact with something later. But what's happening is the body is waking up and saying, okay, I've got to get this aluminum out, I've got to mount an immune response, and now what am I going to respond to? And then we start seeing all sorts of allergies and asthma and problems that may actually be caused by provoking these immune responses. So what Christina Ben has found in this brand new research is that the, the live virus seems to have these non-specific effects of being protective. The non-live virus is associated with much higher infant mortality rates. So we're seeing that when you do non-live vaccines, you're actually creating SIDS. And you know that we have one of the highest infant mortality rates of any country in the industrialized world. And that's very problematic because we are also the most vaccinated country, one of the most vaccinated countries in the world. Whatever your thinking is about vaccines, and I'm someone who chose to vaccinate my children in very judicious ways, not based on the CDC schedule, but based on my own research. But whatever you're thinking about vaccines is, you know, I just, I have to show this, I have to show this because it's so black and white. And this was before, this is from 1983. Here's the vaccine schedule, everybody. There it is, that's it. That's what we were asking children to get. And now this is from 2016, that's probably out of date. Now look, I can't even stretch my fingers to go here and here. So the question we start to ask is, are all these vaccines necessary? Is it safe to give this many vaccines this soon in life what are the synergistic effects? Someone told me that word was too sophisticated, but I'm gonna use it anyway because this is a sophisticated audience. What are the synergistic effects of exposing a fetus and a child to this many vaccines, to the different ingredients, whether they're toxic or not, in that many vaccines at this time? So, one quick story to close. The CDC came to Ashland, Oregon, 20 miles south of here, because a lot of people in Ashland are highly educated and they do a lot of research and they don't do the vaccines on the CDC schedule. So they paid people, I think they paid them, I can't remember if it was 20 bucks, 100 bucks, anyway, I think it was 100 bucks. Was anybody there? Somebody was there. Did they pay you 100 bucks? 50. 50, okay, I was wrong, okay. <laughs> this is why you have to look things up, right? 50. I sort of remember this crisp $100 bill, but I think I'm just making that up. And I think that they expected to be in a room full of hippies who were slinging some crystals around and went outside to hug and kiss the trees. But they were in a room full of people like Michael Frampson who organized this event today, and, and, and I was there and many other people were there, and I think that the CDC was absolutely astonished by the kinds of detailed questions they were getting and the thoughtfulness of the audience. And I think they expected to find hippies and they were gonna get some good languaging about how to force those hippies to stop being so hippie-ish. And what they found was highly educated people and that's what the research shows. The research, the peer-reviewed, published scientific research shows that people who choose not to vaccinate or make judicious choices about vaccines are the highest, are often the most educated and often the most affluent because they're the ones, I mean, they happen to be doing the most amount of research. They also find, another peer-reviewed article shows that people who turn away from vaccines appeal to science and data and rational thinking to make their arguments where people who are vehemently pro-vaccine appeal to emotion and hate, which is the opposite of what the media is telling you, but as we know, it's not only the government that's lying to us, it's also the media. So somebody, and it might have actually been Michael, asked, I think it was John Isinger, Isinger, anyway, I can't remember, but anyway, John, it was the acting head of the immunization program, and, and, I, and it might actually have been Michael, and he said, is it possible that what we've done is we've changed from 
having these infectious diseases, we've eradicated so many things, we've done this, and that we've paid the price of, of chronic illness. And the person who was up there, acting head of director of the immunization program said, that is a concern that we have as well. We don't know the answer to this question, but we are concerned. And what I would say is that everybody is concerned about our children's health. We don't want infectious diseases that ravage us for the rest of our lives, that leave us parallel or paralyzed or leave us dead. But we also don't want something like a cyclical fever disorder where our child is spending a 106 degree fever. No one wants to have a child who dies, either from a, quote, vaccine preventable illness or from a vaccine injury. So we have to work together to get to the bottom of what's going on so that we can fix it together. Thank you.